I'm standing in a dark, closed and humid compartment. The only light in the room is coming from a computer screen illuminating JD, who sits right in front of it. His white shirt is shining from the light of the computer and his glasses are reflecting the screen. I take his arm and I attach a small electrode to it. The electrode has a wire that goes into a box next to the computer. The box has different dials and buttons. I, put the, I take the voltage dial up and I ask JD, did you feel it? Eh, he says. So I turn it up some more. Ouch, he says. Yeah, I felt that. Are you sure? I'm asking him because I can turn it up some more. <laughs> he agrees. So I put it on the max, hit the button to which he says, yeah, that was very unpleasant. So I take my notes and I write JD, white male, age 23, electric shock level, 60 volts. I hit the space bar and the computer starts to run. Colored squares are appearing on the screen. A blue square and a yellow square and a blue square and a yellow square, then a yellow square and a blue square, which is surprisingly fascinating when you're getting electric shocks. <laughs> so. I leave JD alone with the squares and I quietly exit the room. Outside, my eyes need to get used to the brightness. I'm in the middle of a huge laboratory space filled with cubicles and people and everybody are working on their computers. I look at the peephole to see how JD is doing. I feel I have to do this like <laughs> vicious <laughs> laughter because unbeknownst to JD, there's a hidden pattern in the squares. He's gonna get really afraid of the blue square. This is what I do for a living. <laughs> um, at night, after work, I go to storytelling events, kind of like this. But one special night, uh, science and storytelling converged, kind of like this. But that night was in the World Science Festival, and I had an opportunity to tell a story about science. In my story, I tell about this one incident in my parents' house in Israel. I'm on the balcony, and it's a bright, sunny morning, and I'm standing in attention, and I don't move. And inside the kitchen, my mom stands in attention. The neighbors outside walking stop and stand in attention. The drivers stop their cars, step outside, and stand in attention. Even dogs stand in attention, and they do this, what the heck? <laughs> now, the Holocaust is a big deal in Israel, and this here is the opening of the Holocaust Memorial Day, and there's, there's a siren wailing across the country, and we have a whole minute to stand and reminisce. So everybody stands, with one exception, my dad. He sits there with the newspaper, he's wearing a green Moroccan gown, although he's completely Polish, <laughs> and he's uh, <laughs> sipping his morning coffee. Now we start to learn about the Holocaust already in fifth grade, and every year we have quizzes and exams. In sixth grade, they gave us an assignment. The teacher said, go find someone who's been through the Holocaust and write down what they said. So I go home. My father is at the dining table with his gown reading the newspaper. And I go to him and say, Dad, can you tell me about your memories? And uh, he says, nothing, and flips the paper. Since then, every year during the siren of the Holocaust Memorial Day, I have a whole minute to guess what is it out of the stuff we learned at school that he specifically underwent. But in this particular morning, when my father and I sit and stand, respectively, on the balcony, I actually, I don't guess. My mind is wandering back to the lab and to JD, because JD came back the next day, and I show him the blue square again. But this time, I don't need to use the shocks. He's really afraid of the blue square. And this here is a special moment for me, because JD has a fear memory that I created <laughs> floating in his brain. <laughs> Now, JD, unfortunately, doesn't marvel the moment same as I do. But um, I can't help it. This is a moment where a scientific breakthrough happened, not so long ago, and actually around the corner at NYU. The NYU scientists, they did an experiment on the, on the small furry version of JD, a rat. And the rat did exactly like JD, but when the memory was floating in her brain, the scientists hit it with a drug, and the memory was gone. The rat was not afraid anymore. And JD now is in the same situation. Fear is floating in, in his brain. I want to give him the same drug. There's a little problem. If I give him the same drug, I'll kill him. 
So m maybe there's another way, because what the NYU scientists found <laughs> is that there's actually, there's a window of opportunity to change memories. Each time you retrieve a memory, it's vulnerable in your brain. And as long as you don't put it back in, it's unstable, and this is your window. This is when they hit it with a drug. So it's like you take something delicate from a box and you hold it in your hands, and then comes a scientist <laughs> and uh, hit it with a hammer. So there's nothing left for you to put back in the box. But then, here's the thing, even without the hammer, just the fact that you took it out of the box, it's unstable and it's actually constantly changing. And this here is the real discovery. Memories, once we access them, they change. So if you think you remember the original event, you're not. You just remember your last retrieval of it. So if memories change when we access them, all I have to do with JD is have him access the fear memory and then link it with something nice, nice like the blue square with the prize. And next time he's gonna see the blue square, even that he remembers the shock, it's just it's not gonna feel the same. It's not gonna be scary anymore. So this is where my mind wanders, you know, when I'm on the balcony with my father and the siren goes on. And then it hits me. The siren is his blue square. This is why he's not standing. The siren brings up these fear memories and he's just doing something nice to rewrite his feeling of pain. So that was my uh, World Science uh, Festival story. I ended up not knowing my father's memories, but at least I understand. So a few weeks after the World Science Festival, on a Sunday, I get a phone call from my best friend, Millie. And uh, Millie says that on Wednesday, there's a special screening of a Holocaust movie and she wants me to join. I immediately say, no, I fucking hate Holocaust movies. <laughs> On Wednesday morning, I have the worst breakup on the planet. It's so bad that I'm saying, I might as well go to the Holocaust movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the movie is, uh, is first in a series of short documentaries on genocide. Liron, the director, who I meet later, he's following not only the people who experienced firsthand the genocide, but also their kids and their grandkids. He wants to show how the trauma echoes from one generation to the other, like a ripple. So he calls it the Ripple Project. And after we talk, he listens to my World Science Festival story, and he wants to make it into a documentary, part of the series. So I tell him, good luck. You know, my father is not going to talk to anybody. But he insists. He says, at least he's going to capture me trying. Now, at this point, I don't have a lot to lose. My father is 86, 10% of his lungs are functioning, so he's, he breathes very heavily. You can actually you hear him from afar coming. He's like a Polish Darth Vader wearing a Moroccan <laughs> gown. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I say yes, and we all cross the Atlantic to Israel. And I tell my father, you know, the movie's on me, second generation and all, you don't have to do anything. They just want to film us chatting. He agrees, and we set up in the living room. And my father and I sit in the corner where the two sofas meet. He's on the edge of one, I'm not on the edge of the other. Liron is hiding behind a plant, holding a small camera. And David, the other cameraman, is like blending with the curtains. <laughs> and we sit there, we sit there quietly. And after a moment, I break the silence and I ask my dad, Dad, do you want to talk about your memories? And he says, no. And I say, Okay. <laughs> and uh, we just sit there quietly. And as we sit in silence, I'm thinking, you know, I'm really happy Liron is here to capture one of our conversations. <laughs> <laughs> so after a few moments of silence, suddenly my father starts to talk. He says he had a little sister. Her name is Genia. And from the moment she was born, they were inseparable. And she was this happy little kid running in the street. And this was a problem because he would come back home hungry and there was nothing to eat. And when he was 14, he went to work outside the city, a few miles away in a farm. And every day he would pass by a shop that had candies and food. One day, when he came back home, he had a few coins in his pocket. It was payday. So he said, I'm going to surprise Genia. He went into the shop and bought three cookies. And this is how he describes it. He says, 
I was walking and walking and walking, and I was hungry, so I ate one cookie. And then I was walking and walking and walking, I was hungry, so I ate another cookie. And it's okay, because I still had one cookie left. And what do you think happened by the time I came back home? He asks me. I don't know, he says. Well, you know, the Holocaust movies are always about bravery and how you did this and that. Well, you know what? I ate the third cookie. <laughs> That's how it was. So in the days after, I'm trying to sort out the fragments of memories he told me. There were the fragments about his little sister. That was the happiest time in his life. There were the fragments about his mom. She fiercely protected him, and only the two of them survived. And the fragments about his uncle. Everybody thought he was a big miser before the war, but during the war, when they were both starving, he gave him a piece of bread, and he let him have it all. So as I'm trying to sort this out, this out um, I'm coming to a shocking conclusion. These memories are good, even with the third cookie. These are bittersweet moments of love and rare moments of kindness. So I understand my father, again, is two steps ahead of science, because if memories change when we access them, it's the good memories we want to protect. It's like if you have a precious memory and you talk about it in the bar and in a party and with friends, you end up trivializing it, and it doesn't feel the same. But recently, I realized there's actually one way to freeze memories. If you want to keep a memory as is, you carve it into a story. It's like a snapshot in time. And it's not keeping only the content, it's keeping the feeling alive. The best part is, now you're not the only one remembering it. We all are. Thank you.